So uh, thank you, and welcome to my talk, which is the last one. So um, well, I wanted to speak about myself, but basically uh, everything was already explained. So I will just repeat, blah, blah, blah. This admin at Red Hat, so I'm uh, basically working during the day on uh, various projects, and also during the night, because I'm working with projects all around. That's why I look like I didn't sleep. It's because I didn't sleep. <laughs> and uh, we had some uh, problem uh, this morning. That's why I missed uh, the first talk and this kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm not here to complain. I mean, uh, French has already a bad reputation about that, so I will try to avoid that and speak directly about uh, security. So security is quite, uh, well, it's a word that can be used for various stuff from uh, getting a budget from your boss because it's a security issue, we need to get more budget, or just uh, the stuff that you forgot to do. I will uh, just uh, focus on the definition I got in university a long time ago, which is basically around the later CIA, which is not the Central Intelligence Agency, you know, the bad guy before the NSA. It's about uh, confidentiality. So the C is for confidentiality. Confidentiality is when you go to a website, let's say some uh, extramarital uh, dating website like Ashley Madison, and someone managed to get um, access to that and publish the database, again, like uh, Ashley Madison. That's a confidentiality issue. Integrity, it's another kind of a security issue, is when you go to your website, the website of your bank and someone just decides to send the money around, for example, to my own bank account, and if you do that, I will uh, be thankful, but um, it's an integrity issue. The integrity of your bank account has been, well, breached. It's the same if suddenly someone decides to change a website, for example, the website of this conference, and decide to replace all the information with a nice uh, skull uh, spinning with a flame, you know, like what we see in movie, and also in real life. So that's an integrity issue. It's not, uh, sometimes it's with confidentiality issue, sometimes it's not. And the last one is about Availability, so availability is when you try to go on a website and it's not here. So for something like uh, PyCon.sk, well, it's quite problematic, but not so bad. When, when this is a shopping website, suddenly you are starting to lose money. And I do not know how stuff work all over the world, but I'm pretty sure that if you lose money, then you do not get money to be paid and it's quite bad from a professional point of view. So that's something you try to avoid with security. There is a lot of definition, um, but um, most of the time it's also about the different level. Um, if somebody publish, let's say, um, some things that do not matter, like um, the first name of the speaker, of the surprise speaker of a conference, well, it's not a big problem. Suddenly you publish the password of everybody at Facebook, then it's a bigger problem. So to avoid that, you can work on infrastructure, which is my day job, which is making sure that everything works fine. Usually that's setting firewall, web application firewall, SSL, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Most of the time it's about configuration and uh, configuration for confidentiality, integrity, redundancy for availability. For example, if you have only one single server and it's not in the cloud or something fancy like this, and someone starts to put some uh, coffee, I mean some real coffee, like not some Java, I mean I like Java, but I do not want to trash it. So usually most of the time servers do not work that well anymore, and with enough coffee it can completely crush everything. So that's where there is redundancy, you just set two servers and that's it. If possible in two data centers, and if possible in one where people are not authorized to put coffee on other people's servers. So that's part of my job, and there is, well, everything else. And we are on Py at PyCon, so we are going to speak about code. Um, it's not a secret, most uh, computers are running code, most code has a bug and problem, and most of the time when you write something, you need to deploy. I mean, because it's fine, you can write some code and do not use it. It will not be more secure, but at least it will not be more problematic. Most of the time you have to deploy it, which is install, upgrade, and everything. And it turns out that most of the time an upgrade is not free. I mean, it takes some time, sometimes it's five seconds. Sometimes you need to get approval from uh, the vice president and everything and get uh, all the partners to decide if some patch needs to be accepted or not. 
sometimes you cannot even upgrade. I mean, have you already tried to upgrade the software on a plane or a pacemaker? It's more complicated than, it, than you may think. So the idea is that some upgrade can cost uh, some money, some time, or cannot be done. So you need to make sure that you detect problem before, which is obviously as soon as possible. If a problem is present in the code base for five seconds, it's much better than if it's five years. If people are running uh, Linux or following the news, you may have seen some problem about OpenSSL, um, like last month, last year, the year before, or anytime soon. If what is good with OpenSSL, I can keep the same slide for uh, several years. So we want to detect that as soon as possible. And for that, uh, most of the time, we use a static analysis. Uh, in the case of C code, it will be something like uh, Clang, which is coming from a LLVM project, Coverty, or other project. There is no project called etc. just to make sure. But most of the time, it's focused on C. It's not because of C is a bad language, despite what people say. It's because it's a widely used language, and there is a lot of problematic code. And there is fewer tools for Python, except um, that now we start to have a big code base in Python from a Zope, Django, and everything. So some people started a project called Bandit, and it was started by the OpenStack security team. So OpenStack, if you do not know what it is, despite uh, having done a lot of buzz in the five or last year, it's a big uh, uh, infrastructure as a service or whatever as a service uh, project. My uh, own employer did invest a lot of it. So you can go uh, ask to uh, people at the booth about it. They will be quite happy to explain. And it's a million and million of line of code. And the security team was uh, tired of uh, all the security problem uh, to be uh, fixed and everything. So they decided to create a tool which is well, just a big blacklist. So it uses a Python module called uh, IST for abstract uh, syntax tree. So I guess that there is uh, some student in the room. Maybe some of them did compiler, compiler design. So go ask them what it is, because I didn't. I was rather playing Quake at university instead of uh, listening to my uh, teacher. But um, from what I uh, understood, you take uh, the Python source code, you transform it in some kind of uh, well, syntax, which will be abstract, hence so the name. And then you can um, read it without uh, parsing all the ca all kind of variation for string and everything. Because if you do that, you are likely to miss something. Uh, using the IST is much better. It's an interpretary, um, intermediate representation. So you just say, yeah, if you see that function, then do something. So from a purely technical point of view, there is not much in the tool. It's just a blacklist with a list of uh, insecure stuff, and we will see uh, later some uh, example. You can use your own uh, plugin if you want to get uh, some kind of uh, constructs that you know that will be insecure, but that is very specific to your own code base. Well, you can do it. So the problem with this approach is that there is a numerous false positive, so you need to make sure that you understand what is going on. That's why there is various alert severity, from uh, critical to maybe there is something fishy. So let's take a look at a few examples, because um, everybody speaks about security, but it's much better with examples. So let's start with the YAML module. So for people who do not know what is YAML, it's a language to describe data. I do it like every day. Uh, I'm using Ansible for my work, so it requires that. And when I'm not using Ansible, I'm using uh, Salt, which also uses YAML. I love it, but there is one single problem is that in two lines of code, suddenly, depending where the string is coming from, well, you can have a security issue. That's a security issue that was found first on Ruby on Rails. And basically, the problem is that. So for people that do not fluently speak YAML, <coughs> that's a serialization of an object. And that will execute the code, which is a for a dot, uh, directly when you just load the string. So when the YAML is written by the sysadmin for himself, usually we do not do this kind of stuff. When the YAML is coming from, I don't know, someone on the internet, well, maybe you do not want people to just start to send arbitrary code in your process. Because you know, they might start to do something like bad stuff, stealing SSH key, SSL key, stealing password, inserting more money on their account, or moving money, and this kind of stuff. So 
that's the kind of issue that will be detected. Um, YAML load, as seen there, is insecure depending where the string is coming from. The same goes for SQL injection, which is a well-known problem, but you look at this, you say, well, it's fine. It's verification of a username, and uh, where is the problem? Well, the problem is that if someone starts to use that, then we get a more complicated query, which is not at all what we were thinking about. And suddenly, people can get uh, admin access without uh, having them, which is, well, bad. So usually for that, it's, you need to use an ORM, for example, the Django one, ORM for Object Relational Mapper. There is SQL Alchemy, there is a lot of stuff. Do not try to do your own by yourself, um, because it's a lot of a potential problem, and why, why reinvent the wheel when someone did the job. Same goes for uh, cross-seed scripting. Uh, uh, cross-seed scripting. Um, that's when you return JavaScript to the users. So you get a form on a website. Websites are quite great because they are connected on the internet, so most of, lots of people can access it. And they spend their time getting all kinds of uh, input from a random stranger. So that's where you get a real interesting security bug. So um, that's basically when you just enter something, and instead of giving your name, you just give the JavaScript. And then there is something that says, hello, your name, and it prints JavaScript. So that's quite bad. Uh, that's a common problem. And it's even a more common problem because of Jinja. Uh, Jinja is a template language. I assume that people might know about it. It's uh, similar to the one used by Django. It's quite popular. And by default, well, there is no protection because it can be used for more than web page. So the developer said, yeah, we want to use it for email, for all kind of stuff. So by default, it will not be enabled. And it turned out that people do not know that there is no protection by default because some other template do provide it. And that's the kind of stuff that um, a bandit should be able to check. Then comes my favorite type of uh, problem because I keep finding them well, all over the place. Um, for example, I was in the plane coming from Paris. I'm from Paris to Vienna, and I had no internet access, and I was bored. I forgot my book. Um, so I decided to read some source code. I know it's weird, but um, that's the only thing I have on my laptop. So, and I found a security problem based on slash TMP. Basically, the problem is that you have a script. Most of the time, it's a script which start to use something in slash TMP, because you know slash TMP is on every Linux system. There is no problem. Anybody can uh, write there. So it's like perfect. You do not need any kind of complicated installation. And so they start to, most of the time, people do stuff like log there. But if you know the name, someone can just make a symlink. And suddenly, you are starting to write in a file, which is not the one that you were thinking about. And that's quite common uh, for a problem. I did find like one every month or something. And there is various uh, ways to avoid it, but uh, it's better to not uh, have the problem in the first place. Sometimes it's just a, it's just a denial of service. Sometimes it's uh, escalation and everything. So again, that's something that Bandit can detect. It can verify if you are using SSL v2 which was bad when the first time I made this presentation uh, south of France, now it's even worse, uh, given the latest uh, OpenSSL security problem. It checks if you do not verify the certificate. It checks if you are using Marshall, which is something that can be used to um, serialize an object. So if you are reading arbitrary object, maybe you will be uh, reading an object that is not the one you think you are reading. The same goes for Pickle, for exec. As soon as you start to exec uh, various, uh, various software, maybe you will see some issue, et cetera, et cetera. And most of the time, it's always the same kind of problem. You have a data which you think is a string, but suddenly it's not a string. It's a string and a SQL command. It's a, a code for HTML, and there is JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera. So let's assume that I convince you to run Bandit, because, well, I hope that uh, you will do that for security. What to do if you find something, because you take your code, you run it, and boom, it shows a lot of stuff. Well, first, you need to estimate the problem. As I said, there is a lot of uh, false positive. Like, basically, each time that uh, something is using exec, it will say, yeah, maybe you need to check that, maybe you need to check that. So 
most of the time it's fine, sometimes it's not. So for that, you need to read the source code. I will assume that you have the source code, mostly because bandits do not work on uh, anything but source code. You need to check the severity, like is it something which will be bad or not? It's, it can be quite complicated if it's your first time, but uh, you can see for very, for very small stuff, like just uh, uh, cross-seed scripting, it's quite easy to see that if you have cross-seed scripting, then it's bad, because people can steal a session cookie, people can just um, make all kind of a remote uh, call with Ajax and everything, so do not, if you just see that there is a problem, do not go far, further away, but say it's bad. You can contact a specialist. It's quite easy. You just uh, find them in some uh, security conference or some uh, dark place or this kind of stuff, or on the internet, just uh, trolling each other about antivirus or this kind of stuff. Ideally, you can contact the project, um, if possible, in a private way. That's usually where I insert a GitHub around, because there is no private bug on GitHub. And most of the time, people do not publish their email, so they do not get uh, spammed. So you need to do some work to find uh, who to contact and everything. If you do not want to do that, you can also just uh, publish that. Maybe if you will become famous, most of the time you will just be ignored. Uh, what you need also to do is to get a CV identifier. So a CV is just a number. It dates back to the time before we started to give name to a security problem. And most of the security problems have just uh, an identifier, so to get that, you can uh, request to Linux distribution. Usually, I just go to see uh, two people uh, from the security team at Red Hat, because, well, we are working on a Linux distribution, so I can directly ping them. If you do not want to contact a Linux distribution, or if you are just uh, using Mac OS X and you do not know what is Debian, uh, SUSE, or Ubuntu, and you think it's just Pokemon name, well, it's fine. We can also go to the list uh, open source security, uh, which is OSSSEC on openworld.net, I think. And you just say, yeah, I found that security problem. Can I get a CV? And maybe you can get one in uh, one or two weeks, depending on uh, the load of people who are supposed to do that. Uh, if you are reading Linux Weekly News, there is a good article at the moment on the topic. So I will not, um, not rehash that. And I want to remind that Bandit do not do everything. Uh, because it's nice to do static analysis, but uh, it can give a false positive and it can also avoid to detect something. If bandit detects nothing, that does not mean that your code is secure, that just means that it detected nothing. So, two examples. So, um, as part of my job, I'm uh, trying to help uh, people from uh, the website softwarecollection.org. If you are running uh, CentOS or RHEL, it's quite a nice website that provides a backport for various. Uh, stack like uh, Python 3, Ruby 2, everything and everything. And uh, they called me because they needed a sysadmin. And it turned out that, contrary to some other projects, they did everything well. Like, everything was properly administrated, there was a firewall, there was backup, SL Linux, and all kind of stuff. But they still managed to get one very, very specific problem um, that I just put on the slide because I do not have enough space to put the diff. And it was just a specific problem with an injection in an RPM build. So for people who do not know what is RPM, it is the package system of uh, Red Hat and other distribution. And it turned out that the website was creating an RPM directly on the web server, which is, well, bad, but not so bad. And using an obscure feature that I know because my roommate was working on RPM, well, I was able to Technically, because I do not test on production, or at least I do not, I pretend I do not do that when there is a camera filming me. Technically, someone who would have detected that would have been able to execute code directly on the web server, which is bad. And it turned out that, well, no one did, because you need to register to create a repository and everything. It's like there is a lot of audits, so we did see that no one did anything. But yeah. That's quite bad, and I found that just by looking where there is some code execution, and it turned out that this one was all right working. The second one is uh, Epsilon. So I like to boast about myself, but this one is something that we found before breakfast. Like I was discussing with someone in a federal conference, and before we get to breakfast, we found something. So Epsilon is a provider for SAML, OpenID, Persona, or whatever authentication. The bug is this one. 
And basically, it's just that uh, they forgot to add some code. Like, there was an operation that should have been restricted to only the admin, and it turned out that they forgot to place the restriction. And yeah, basically, Bandit cannot detect code that was not written for security purpose or anything like this. And in the end, if you want to find uh, more information about the whole topic, so you can go on owasp.org, which is a website dedicated on uh, listing all kinds of uh, theoretical uh, stuff about security vulnerability, like uh, all kinds of uh, obscure stuff, like LDAP injection, which is the same as SQL injection, but when you are using LDAP, buffer overflow, all kinds of uh, stuff with uh, sometimes good examples, sometimes um, bad example. It's a wiki, so it's like uh, Wikipedia without the Pokemon and focus on security. You can also learn about uh, this by reviewing security patch. So that's easy. You just uh, see a software, you just wait for an update and see if there is a security patch. That's why you need to make sure that you get the CVE ID in the change log, so people do not have to check everything in Git log. I do that from time to time. I used to be working on a Linux distribution as a packager. And when we have to backport the fix, it's much easier when you see, oh, that's this chain log in Git, in Mercurial, in CVS, or whatever. Take the code and try to adapt it. Then read everything that was done since two months and try to find where is the security issue. Um, you can also check the update list on Linux Weekly News. Uh, it's like every day of uh, the week, so not on Sunday and not on uh, the weekend. And you can just uh, check and you see, oh, that software, I know about it. Maybe I can check what is the problem. You want to learn about PHP, just wait until there is some problem in WordPress, which happens quite often. If it's not WordPress, it will be Drupal or any kind of CMS. And last, while well, you can start your own audit, you just uh, do that by yourself. Just take a plane to Paris, come back to Vienna, and when you will be flying, you have no internet access, so you can do that. That's what I do. You need to check uh, critical code. So critical code is code that either deal with authentication, because that's where interesting stuff happened, or code that take um, untrusted input, which is basically everything coming from the user and uh, the user or other system. <coughs> and that's it. So I was faster than expected, according to my clock. Um, so if you have any question, maybe it's uh, the time. And if you are too shy, uh, you can contact me on uh, mail, because I have no Twitter account, no LinkedIn account, or anything. Or you can just uh, ping me on uh, IRC. I'm there, uh, well, almost every time. Because as soon as I have internet access, I do have access to IRC. You can contact on my uh, mailbox at redhat.com, or if it's something that you want to keep more private, you can use uh, zarb.org. And that's it. If you have any questions, it's the time. Okay, so the first question, can you show a small live demo of Bandit in action? No. Well, I can, but I... Okay. Do people want a demo or not? Because maybe it's not the... Tomorrow. I'm not here tomorrow, so I cannot do a workshop. But maybe you can do one. <laughs> no? Well, I can try to do it, but uh, it will be complicated. <laughs> That's not very nice to say that. Nope. Oh, mm, nope. Oh, good. So, first let's check if it's installed. Nope, it's not installed. Sorry? Yeah, but for now it's not working because it's, uh, well, not installed. So no, I cannot uh, make a demo. <laughs> or at least I can make a demo, but as expected, it do not work. Next question, sorry. <laughs> yes, you did a demo of missing module. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the next one. Uh, can you clarify what's wrong with writing into TMP directory? Do you think it can be dangerous even if you don't write any sensitive data there? So uh, with TMP directory, the problem is that everybody can uh, access and access it. Um, for example, let's say that I have a web server, like just uh, some test web server, which is deployed in production. And I deploy in, uh, on a server where people do have access. 
for example, uh, shell servers that, as we can see in the university, or as we can see in, uh, for example, the federal infrastructure. And you decided that it's easier to write the log on a slash TMP, slash TMP log. So you start the web server, and it writes everything in slash TMP log. And you do not check anything, but someone decided to just make a link between that and some user account. So that means that the log will be written in the user account on an arbitrary place. Then the only thing I need to do is to push something in the log, like a request. It's a web server that looks like some file, for example, let's say a SSH key. And if I manage to write that in a dot SSH authorized key, well, suddenly I can write arbitrary keys there. So that's the kind of security problem you can see. If you are running that, it's mostly a problem for a shared uh, server. Most of the time, it's not a big issue. But if someone gets access to some application because there is a problem in one application, suddenly he can start to crash other application, execute, make uh, some kind, just, for example, you are a student, someone has your thesis, you do not do backup because backup are for WIMP. That's what other people say. And someone just uh, managed to make, a, to replace that with the log of the web server because of the so-called uh, symlink problem. Well, sorry, you have to start again. And that's the kind of problem. Sometimes it's mostly harmless problems. That's why people do not fix them. Sometimes it's uh, the system do not start again. Uh, like if it cannot open the log file because someone changed the permission, well, maybe something will not work. You reboot your server, it do not work, and in the middle of the night, you start to get a text message from Nagios. And I can tell you that you do not want to get text message in the middle of the night. At least I do not want to do that. So, yeah. But I hope that's a good answer. If not, I can explain. Just send me an email, and I will be happy to give uh, more pointer and all kind of uh, crazy uh, escalation paths around this kind of problem. Uh, using cloud services, GitHub, Travis, etc., versus self-hosted Jenkins GitLab for development from security point of view. Okay, so the question is using Travis versus self-hosted for security point of view. Uh, for CI system, well, from a security point of view, um, I tend to prefer, I must use admin, so obviously I will say, yeah, do your self-hosting because that's more work for me. And I want to make sure that I get a job. Um, then it depends. Uh, I use Travis for my own stuff because I do not like Jenkins. Uh, at the same time, uh, you cannot do a lot of stuff with uh, Travis. I need to test uh, stuff on CentOS. I cannot do that with uh, Travis. Or I need to use uh, Docker, and then suddenly I have another problem, which is Docker. At the same time, well, Jenkins is problematic for several point of view. For example, the RPM are not served over SSL. Uh, the security bugs uh, are found quite often, and they are quite um, scary. And while well, it breaks quite often on upgrade and everything, so I will tend to say to people, if it works on Travis, use Travis. If it works on Jenkins, use something else, like BuildBot, which is uh, Python, so it's better by definition. I'm just saying that because we are at a Python conference, uh, just to make sure if some Java guy sees that. Okay, so the last one. Uh, what kinds of issues can Bandit detect in Python code? Um, well, all the issues that I showed in the, in the presentation. I do not have the exact list. It's uh, written on the website, which is uh, somewhere on OpenStack. I can go read the source code right now, but I think it will not be a good answer. So just uh, see again my presentation and see the website and the documentation. Sorry. OK, so uh, that was the last question, because we don't have time for uh, any uh, next questions. So thank you in French. It would be merci beaucoup, yes? Yes, exactly that. So. Thank you.